Good evening from Johannesburg. My name is Moki Makura. I am the Executive Director of Africa No Filter, and I'm your moderator for today's program, which is on the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa. Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. So let's get straight to it. The world has changed and everything feels very different, but it's been just over a year now since the partnership was launched under the French G7 presidency. The partnership's goal is simple. It's to bring over 400 million people, many of whom are women, into the digital economy for the very first time. In 2019, which does feel like an absolute lifetime ago, the G7 partnership delivered a blueprint to the G7, which included a report that identified five key areas in which G7 countries could partner with African countries. I just want to take a few moments to remind us all of what those recommendations were in that report. The first was to build interoperable digital payment infrastructure. The second was to build equitable digital identification systems. The third was to update financial regulations to make space for these new products and services. And the fourth was to help countries identify the right investments and policies. And the fifth one, the most important one, was to prioritize gender. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about why this fifth priority is absolutely critical. Um, so another key part of the partnership was around accountability. And this piece is being led by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And they will be reporting back on progress against the goals every year. And those goals are more important and more urgent than ever before because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which in six months has wiped out more than five years of progress in global development. So wherever, wherever in the world you are sitting today, you are probably feeling and you are definitely seeing the impact, the impact of COVID. So today, our program is under the theme of catalyzing digital financial services for women across Africa, supporting recovery, resilience and innovation during COVID-19. May not be a terribly catchy heading, but it spells out the themes for today's session. And we're bringing together leadership in the public, private, development and academic sectors to discuss financial inclusion and economic resiliency for women in Africa. So let me briefly take you through the program today and what you can expect for the next hour and a half. And we will have today four brief keynote speeches followed by a panel. That's pretty much what we're doing today. Um, we, are, we will first hear from Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, followed by President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. And then we have Melinda Gates, who's the co-chair of the Villa Melinda Gates Foundation and the French ambassador to the UN, Nicolas, Nicolas de Riviere. So each of them will deliver brief remarks and then we'll move on to the panel. And our panel today is made up of representatives from two African governments, from academia, we have a regulator in the house and we have somebody representing the private sector and they will all be providing more practical insights about the progress and the challenges we're seeing on the ground. I will introduce the panel a little bit later in the program. So let's get straight to our first keynote, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. She's going to be speaking first in her capacity as the United Nations Secretary General, Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. And as a special advocate, Queen Maxima is a leading global voice on advancing universal access to financial services. As she does this by raising awareness, by serving as a convener and encouraging leaders to take action. So please welcome Queen Maxima. Thank you, Madam Akura. Thank you very much for having me today here. It is really a pleasure to be uh, with you today alongside Mrs. Melinda Gates, uh, an esteemed co-champion of the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital and Financial Inclusion in Africa. I'm also happy that Nicolas de Rivière, Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations for France, will be saying some words also on behalf of Minister Le Maire. And I would like to thank the panelists, uh, Minister Lawson, Minister Tolina, Dr. Undulu, Dr. Suri 
and Mrs. Obonai for sharing really your experiences with us today. And also, I would like to thank President of South Africa, Sir uh, Ramaphosa, for his video intervention. The critical development challenges facing Africa today, including safe water and sanitation, fragile health systems, and economic informality, made the continent particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. The crisis has caused severe output losses, which have led to significant food and employment shocks. African women have borne the brunt of all of these shocks. 89% of women in sub-Saharan Africa work informally, a sector with limited savings and capital, making them particularly vulnerable to economic shocks. Also, women-owned businesses tend to be smaller with less access to financial resources compared to men. So new data suggests that in several sub-Saharan countries, about 60% of women-led small businesses have lost their sources of income, three times more than businesses led by men. In response to the pandemic, over 200 countries have expanded social protection systems, many using digital payments to provide transfers directly into bank accounts or mobile wallets. South Africa, Togo, Burkina Faso, Zambia, and Nigeria all scaled up rapidly, specifically targeting women. These programs provide an economic lifeline for very vulnerable people and are really the key entry point to the formal financial system. Digital payments are therefore key to COVID-19 response and are really essential for future recovery efforts. Now, whilst financial inclusion is particularly important for women's economic empowerment, today, 60% of the 400 million financially excluded adults in the whole continent are actually women. So what is standing in our way to make digital financial inclusion for women a reality? First of all, access to a mobile telephone and internet connection is an extremely necessary starting point. But Sub-Saharan Africa has a 41% gender gap with regards to mobile internet use. This disparity could be reduced. Also, having regulation in place that allows for mobile money and agents that are close to where women live and work is really an important prerequisite to use digital financial services for COVID-19 response. There still also remains a 9% gender gap in ID between men and women in Sub-Saharan Africa. People without a government recognized proof of identity often cannot open accounts and are shut off of the formal financial system. Tier customer due diligence processes are really needed to quickly onboard beneficiaries for mobile wallets and smaller value accounts. And lastly, but not least, consumer protection policies are also key to ensure that the use and access to digital financial services does not increase the digital divide or gender inequality. Now, without these prerequisites in place, countries could be left behind, relying on cash-based manual systems that are extremely costly and prone to leakages. These enablers will also provide an entrance for women participation of digital economy, including e-commerce platforms and telehealth services. Now, of course, the crisis response has not stopped at payments only. Governments have supported businesses with emergency credit lines and boasted the reach of credit guarantee programs. These measures help businesses weather the storm, of course. But it is important these programs target those entrepreneurs who need it the most and are made available through financial institutions that cater to them, such as microfinance institutions and cooperatives. The role of fintech sector is in supporting COVID-19 response really proves critical. They play an important role in developing tailored and accessible financial products. This include remittances, which are an important lifeline during the crisis, but also smaller, flexible working capital loans. 
Therefore, to create an innovative and safe regulatory environment for these new actors is more important than ever. The G7 partnership offers an important opportunity to unlock digital financial inclusion for women so that women can live more productive and have safer lives. We must now scale up action through the partnership with specific targets in order to monitor and accelerate progress. I would really like to thank again Melinda Gates and the French government for the co-championship of this partnership and of course the commitment of African policymakers to make digital financial inclusion for women a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Highness, and for helping us set the scene for this discussion. I think some of those data points you gave us were, were quite eye-opening. And the complexity of getting cash to vulnerable groups on this scale shows the importance of having digital public goods like ID systems, payment systems, and financial products in place. And so we are going to hear more from the countries themselves on how they are navigating these challenges. So thank you very much, Your Highness. Um, our next speaker is President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa, who is also the current chair of the African Union. In South Africa, under his leadership, gender equality is a national priority, and he's also supporting global efforts through Generation Equality, which is an, an ambitious effort to achieve gender equality by 2030. I'd like to welcome President Ramaphosa, who I believe has sent a film. Thank you. Your Excellencies, as South Africa and as the Chair of the African Union, we fully support the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa. By giving women the tools to become financially secure and independent, we are essentially investing in a society in which women's rights to dignity, security, and financial empowerment is secured. We must enable women to take advantage of technological advances, to start their own businesses, to trade, and to seek employment. The coronavirus pandemic has had a dramatic effect on economic activity on the continent and around the world. Its impacts will be hardest felt by women, many of whom are employed and operate in the informal sector. Women must have greater access to affordable financial services. They must have access to working capital, credit lines, insurance, and to digital tools such as mobile banking platforms. Governments must invest in the financial education of women and girls. In support of greater economic and financial inclusion, South Africa has made a commitment of 500,000 US dollars to the African Women's Impact Fund, which seeks to empower women financial leaders. We have also announced that 40% of all public procurement should be reserved for women-owned businesses and we are working with the AU member states to develop similar policy guidelines across the continent. We believe that a digitally enabled economy with a strong emphasis on gender equality has the potential to be transformative, to be fair and sustainable and competitive. Africa continues to develop its ICT infrastructure to advance greater access to technology. Through digital platforms, a greater number of women will be able to have access to funding and online banking, fulfilling a need that traditional banking services are unable to meet. Unless women are brought into the mainstream of the economy, they will for ever continue to bear the brunt of exclusion and marginalization and be vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. A nation that empowers its women is a strong nation and it's also a sustainable nation. It is our wish that world leaders use this occasion 
to reaffirm their commitment to the Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa. I thank you. Let me just thank President Ramaphosa for your comments. Thank you very much. And it's really great to see a male world leader prioritizing women's economic empowerment and gender equality. I'm extremely happy to hear about the money that's gone into this African Women Impact Fund and the move for 40% of public procurement. I mean, for, for public procurement to go to 40% um, of women. Or I think that was the, the piece. But anyway, I would now like to introduce Melinda Gates, who is the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She is a tireless campaigner for gender equality who uses her voice to elevate the issues that women face across the world. She's also famous for putting her money where her mouth is. And over the years, she has donated billions of dollars to development, especially related to gender. Welcome, Melinda, and thank you. Thanks, Moki. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I would like to thank Her Majesty Queen Maxima, His Excellency President Ramaphosa and Minister De Rive for all they're doing to champion women's digital financial inclusion. I'd also like to thank today's panelists for joining us. You represent the leadership and collaboration we need to alleviate poverty, accelerate gender equality, and boost financial inclusion. And my thanks to UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network for bringing us all together today. So COVID-19 began, as we know, as a medical emergency, but it hasn't stayed that way. The pandemic has led to the greatest global economic crisis since the Great Depression. And this crisis is landing squarely on the shoulder of women. Early estimates suggest that women are nearly twice as likely to lose their jobs as men. And low-income women are even at greater risk. Low-income women in low-income countries are at the greatest risk. These are the garment workers, the food sellers, who have to close their shops because very few people are gathering in outdoor markets. And the data shows that these women cannot just wait out the pandemic. After the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, studies found that men's income rebounded fairly quickly, but women's on the other hand did not. Since COVID-19 slowed the wheels of our global economy, 37 million people have fallen back into extreme poverty. And I worry that those 37 million will stay there even after the pandemic is over, especially the women. As an optimist, I do think there's hope. We can avert the worst case scenario, but only if leaders like you here today prioritize women in your response. One way to do this is to deliver emergency cash transfers to citizens and directly to women. These transfers can be effective at preventing the pandemic from locking women into the cycle of poverty. But first, the cash has to get into women's pockets. And too often it doesn't. It ends up in the pockets of their husbands or other male family members, or nowhere at all. Governments don't send the money because they don't know the women exist, or there aren't ways to deliver the funds directly to the accounts that the women control. And that's why any discussion about women's economic empowerment must also be a conversation about digital payment systems and digital IDs. We must focus on the infrastructure to digitize, direct, and deliver this economic support to the women who need it most. We have an opportunity here, but we need to take advantage of it. That's why we are having this discussion about women's economic empowerment. What happens in response to pandemics becomes part of history. If we were meeting in New York this week, I'd point you towards Central Park because city officials started planning the park right after a cholera outbreak. They thought at that time that more open space might prevent the spread of disease. So here we are a century and a half later. If anything is going to be redesigned, it's the map of our financial system. This year, we are witnessing the fastest, farthest reaching transfer of cash payments from governments 
to the people in history. Will women benefit equally? None of us know that yet. But I hope that if we do our jobs right, they will, and that it will set a precedent for all the years to come. Thank you for so much for your work in this area. It's so vastly important. Thank you very much, Belinda, um, for that. I think the point for me is that women's economic empowerment is intrinsically linked to digital financial services. So thank you for, for sharing that with us and for reminding us about the urgency of the situation and the need to focus on the women who need it most. Right, so our next and final speaker was supposed to be the French economy and finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, who is a gender and financial inclusion champion. But many of you may know that he was recently diagnosed with COVID and is currently in isolation. So we wish him a full recovery. In his place, we have, in his place, we have the French ambassador to the UN, Ambassador Riviere, who will deliver a few words on behalf of Minister Le Maire. Welcome, Ambassador. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you, together with Her Majesty Queen Maxima, uh, President Ramaphosa, and also Melinda Gates. As you just said, uh, Bruno Le Maire, the Minister of Economy in France, has just got caught with COVID-19, and he cannot be with us today. And I will say a few words on his behalf. First, I would like to say, that gender equality is a key priority for France in its national and international policies. As you know, several ambitious deliverables have been launched during the French G7 presidency last year to promote and advance women's and girls' rights. And we will continue to enhance our actions on this issue, especially through our feminist diplomacy. We are almost one year after the release of the report G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa, which was presented at the Finance Minister meeting in July 2019 during the French presidency of the G7. This report highlighted synergies between various public policies to reach this goal. Regulation, payment interoperability, digital identity research. Since then, the health and economic consequences of the pandemics showed us that digitalization is more crucial than ever to avoid the transmission of disease, help vulnerable groups, proceed to government transfers for social protections, do health payments, or mobilize money for a relative. Women have been especially hit by the COVID-19 crisis and its consequences, and they are at the front line of the response to the pandemic. Women support most of the domestic tasks, including healthcare, and are overrepresented in the service sector. Moreover, they encounter higher risks of revenues loss due to their overrepresentation in the informal sector. According to ILO, in Africa, 90% of working women are in the informal sector, which deprive them for, from social protection. But the pandemic appears also as a game changer and is the occasion to explore new digital approaches. In this regard, Togo, developed a very innovative welfare system, Novici, which we are proud to support through the French Development Agency. Novici provides a bimensional support with mobile money to informal workers and women accounts for 65% of the beneficiaries. Tina Lawson, who will also take the floor, will explain better than I. From this project and other realizations, we know I have to draw lessons to build back better. What, has already a develop, what was al already a development challenge became an indispensable element of the economic and social response to the crisis, both for short-term relief and long-term recovery. According to studies, 
digital finance has the potential to provide access to financial services for 1.6 billion people in emerging economies, more than half of them women. It could increase the volume of loans extended to individuals and businesses by $2.1 trillion, as well as allow government to save $110 billion per year. This is why France encourages international donors and African government to incorporate investments in digital financial inclusion as part of their COVID-19 response to foster more inclusive, secure, and resilient economies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Riviere, and especially for that call to action for donors. And it's wonderful to see Francis leading the way in this PAFAM partnership. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our session of keynote speakers. So to Queen Maxima, to President Ramaphosa, to Melinda Gates, and to you, Ambassador Riviere, thank you all for your vision, for your leadership, and for your support of women's financial inclusion on the continent. So we're about to move on to the panel discussion, discussion now, which will bring some deeper context to many of the issues that our speakers today have already covered. But before that, we're going to show you a brief film that puts this work into context. It's the voices of the women we are working to empower through financial inclusion, and we really hope it inspires you and keeps you pushing. to keep all money in my bag, which is risky. But this time I'm not worried because I have all the money on my food. It has made business easier and safer for me because I don't need to carry cash here. I can pay using my savings or I can pay using my deposit. It simplified the time and the costs of trade for me. needed to empower myself rather than relying on the parents alone. When I have an official national ID, I feel secure and safe as a woman, as a trader. My business has helped me as a single parent and I've managed to maintain my family. I can help my siblings, my friends, yeah. Women form the bedrock of our homes and by extension our society. So if we help them grow their businesses, we'll be able to have a very good economy overall. Thanks for that film. And women do indeed form the bedrock of our homes and by extension our society. Right, so let's move on to the panel now. We have five speakers and about probably about an hour now, maybe to, uh, to unpack some of the progress and the challenges we are seeing on the ground. The panel will be picking up on the issues that our speakers have touched on today. And if you do have burning questions, please use the Q&A function and I'll incorporate them where I can. So I'd love to ask all of the speakers to turn their cameras on. I see some of you are doing that already as I introduce you. So first up is Professor Tavneet Suri, who is a professor of applied economics at MIT and the scientific director for Africa at JPAL. She's done considerable research on digital money with a focus on Kenya. Then we have the, the former governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania, Professor Beno Ndulu, who is the co-director of the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, which sits at Oxford University. And the organization examines how countries can turn technological change into opportunities for inclusive development. Professor Ndulu is also a high level advisor to the World Bank ID4D initiative. Next, we have the Minister of Posts and Digital Economy and Technical Innovation for the Republic of Togo, Minister Sina Lawson. And then we have the State Minister, Ministry of Finance in Ethiopia, Dr. I'm sorry, yeah, Dr. Tolina, apologies. 
And representing the voice of the private sector, we have Patricia Obonai, the CEO of Vodafone in Ghana. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. So let's get started with the panel. And I'm gonna direct the first question to Professor Tabneet Suri. Have we all got our cameras on? Tabneet? Okay, so Tabneet, Pro Professor Suri, apologies, let me call you that. We saw some of the benefits of digital financial service in the film just now. And this is an area you, I know, have been researching extensively. So let's start with the why. Why do you think digital financial services help women in particular? And what have you learned from your research on mobile money and digital cash transfers during COVID-19? And what's their impact on women? Thanks, Smokey. Thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here today. And thank you everyone for watching on this really important topic. Uh, you know, we've been given an introduction by a bunch of great folks. So let me sort of just go straight to Moki's question and answer it. You know, we spent a bunch of years studying uh, the mobile money system in Kenya called M-Pesa and trying to trace out how it was changing people's lives, both from soon after it launched till about 10 years later. Um, and so uh, we were finding initially that um, what it did was it improved something we call financial resilience. Financial resilience is this concept of when bad things happen to you, can you kind of get through them? Can you power through them? And so we find that mobile money improves the ability of households, poor households to get through bad events, like your kid getting sick, like a drought, like floods, like all of these bad things that unexpectedly happen, mobile money allowed people to be more resilient towards them. And then as we traced this out over the longer term, Moki, we saw that basically when you're better protected and you're less vulnerable to these kind of big bad events, you make higher return investments because you know you're better protected. So we see um, that over the longer term, mobile money in Kenya led to about a two percentage point reduction in poverty um, across the country. We also see that these effects are bigger for female headed households. And then we try to understand where this was coming from. Where is this coming from? And it turns out to be coming from women switching occupations. We saw women both in male headed households and in female headed households switch out of agriculture into starting businesses. And so this was something it allowed them to do. You know, others who spoke earlier, like Melinda mentioned, you know, women having an account that's their own, and this is essential to them being able to kind of diversify their lives and diversify what they do and take these opportunities of starting businesses, of doing more. And we saw that uh, over kind of a longer period, over like a 10 year period. So that was kind of work we did in Kenya. Um, I will say this, it's kind of nice to watch the research space in some sense, I am a researcher, I'm okay, I apologize. <laughs> but the resilience effects we saw that it starts off with, right? It starts off with this improvement in re resilience, improvement in vulnerability, and then grows into this ability to do more. Those effects are now being documented by other researchers in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Mozambique, and Bangladesh. And so it's been nice to see that there's this consistency of how digital services are helping protect the vulnerable in these countries. The second piece, um, the second piece I'll just, no, I was just going to ask you quickly, you, you said that women are switching occupations a lot. Just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so we see about over 200,000 women as a result of mobile money switch out of agriculture as their main occupation and into a retail mm -hmm. business. Okay, Moki, don't think starting an Apple store, right? This is a small scale micro enterprise in, a, 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 you know, in a, a, for poor, in poor areas, right? So, they're starting to diversify incomes. They're starting to go out and, you know, get into retail. Let me start a little stall that sells all my stuff and then I get income on it, right? So that's kind of what we saw uh, out of that. Um, I'll mention one other piece of work that's kind of hot off the presses, uh, simply because we're starting to think about COVID and what COVID has sort of brought in terms of vulnerabilities. And, over the last two years, we've been running a study on universal basic income, UBI, in two of the poorest counties, two of the poorer counties in Kenya. Um, and these people have been getting cash transfers over the past two years. <clears throat> and this is all done digitally over the mobile money system. It's kind of like the Novisi program that Togo set up now in response to COVID. And we were testing a version of that in Kenya, but kind of a, a basic income streamed over time. 
And so <clears throat> before COVID hit, we were already documenting the impacts of this. And then we went back to see, do these impacts last? So basically what we saw for the transfers is they help people start businesses, they improve health, physical and mental health, they improve food security. And then when we went back in June to see, oh my God, these guys got cash transfers and some of them are still getting cash transfers. Do they still continue to do better as the country puts in all these policies for COVID? And we see that food security is still better as a result of the cash transfers. They, the businesses are still open and there. Um, the business income has gone down. We saw big increases before COVID in business income and the business income comes down. Now, COVID also hit at a time which was agricultural seasonality. So this could be just the hungry season in this part of the world. But it does show you, you know, they're starting businesses, there's still more volatility in income. But then we also see food security is still better. So basically what the UBI did was allow people to start businesses, allow them to kind of manage the fluctuations in business profits, which happen when you have a business, and still maintain food security, right? And they didn't have to shut down the businesses because they can kind of manage through it and maintain their household and not worry about where they're going to feed their kids from. You know, it's unlikely that a UBI is the perfect way to deal with COVID, Moki, though. You know, you know, VC is a big cash transfer that kind of deals with such a big shock. Uh, we were just in the position that we were already doing a study that had cash transfers coming to a set of poor households in Kenya. And so we had the opportunity to study the impacts. Um, and like I said, these are all coming digitally, uh, you know, which is really important at a time like this. You wouldn't want to be delivering in person anything right now, right? Um, I, I mean, I think all of this work, both my own and others that are working on these digital systems and both social protection as well as just use of and access to these digital platforms, um, we see that they're helping poor households and especially women both grow their incomes and diversify their activities, which helps them kind of, you know, broaden what they're trying to do, broaden their income set, broaden their opportunity set. Um, and I'm hoping we'll see more of that, uh, more of that work and more investment in, in sort of studying these things as we go forward. Okay, I'll hand back to you. Right, thank you, Professor Suri, and I certainly hope we do see more investment. And we are going to um, be speaking to the Minister um, more about the Novisi um, programme, which, which you also mentioned. So let me move on to Professor um, Ndulu now. Um, I'd like to come to you next because you are a, or you were a former regulator. So you've got some practical insights, I'm sure, that you can share. For example, you know that the introduction of mobile money does not automatically lead to the inclusion of the poor and marginalised as Melinda mentioned, and that women and girls are often excluded at the very start. So how can governments design digital public goods and regulations to take women's and girls' needs into account in the first place? Thank you. Um, first, I think just to make an observation that uh, COVID-19 has definitely made a much stronger case for the importance uh, of uh, digital transformation, not just of economies, but also of livelihood. Those that had been uh, onboarded during that uh, time, particularly during the period of containment, were able to cope much better than those who were not. And uh, we saw a number of uh, central banks and African governments actually uplift the limits for use in uh, uh, use of uh, um, uh, mobile money uh, in terms of making payments, partly because that uh, uh, did uh, actually allow people to uh, interact without uh, the uh, contact that typically cash would involve. So already that is quite, quite clear. So. Um, I'm going to focus um, on three areas of intervention, particularly now uh, that we are moving towards uh, recovery. Um, the first one is just bridging the access and usage gap. Um, although about three quarters of uh, the population in Sub-Saharan Africa have a mobile connection, only a third of these user smartphones uh, and the internet. 
and studies show, as uh, Queen Maxima actually already alluded to, that uh, women in Africa are um, 30 to 40 percent less likely than men actually to use the internet to participate uh, in public life. So um, uh, we need to go directly to those factors that actually uh, account for these uh, gaps. Uh, there are three I'll mention quickly. One is affordability of uh, digital services. Um, only 10 out of 45 sub-Saharan African countries actually meet the one for two affordability standard uh, for internet recommended by the UN Broadband Commission. It means one GB not to cost not more than 2% uh, of monthly income. That's the one for two. Uh, and um, I think uh, we, in this particular challenge, uh, businesses have a role to play as much as governments have. Businesses uh, should have pricing models that actually make uh, um, digital services accessible, including those that typically uh, do uh, cross subsidies between those that can afford it better and those that can afford it less. Uh, but I would like also to single out uh, over taxation of digital and financial services as one of the culprits that need uh, definitely to be fixed. Second, fit for purpose content tailored to women needs. This has to be uh, both accessible and useful. Um, and uh, language is important. Uh, it's no good uh, offering those services if people cannot understand. And definitely also cultural uh, relevance. Third is strengthening consumer capabilities, which is digital skills uh, via training programs and instruction, which sometimes is embedded in the delivery of the product itself. So that is one area. The second area is deepening quality of usage beyond payment transfers. Um, and here, I would like to focus particularly on access and use of credit. Um, there are two particular areas I want to emphasize under that. Um, the first one is unsecured credit um, and the role of credit scores in enabling that. Collateral, we know, is a big challenge, and particularly for women. Uh, but now, um, uh, through uh, um, uh, uh, digital and uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, Internet of Things, it's possible to actually uh, do credit scores which can be used uh, actually to um, uh, back up uh, any uh, application for credit without necessarily uh, involving collateral. You sort of uh, collateralize yourself by good behavior in terms of payment and repayment. Um, proportionality in KYC to enable easier uh, onboarding into the formal banking system. Uh, digital ID, most important in respect to that. 83% uh, of banks in Sub-Saharan Africa require a government approved ID to open account. And ID4D uh, uh, have done a lot of work in those areas. Uh, and countries have to do national risk assessment to guide proportionality and also uh, emphasize interoperability across the foundational digital platforms, which is ID, uh, payments, uh, and infrastructure. I'll go to the last. Uh, important uh, area, which is increasing value and reducing risk in the informal sector. Uh, we heard uh, how um, the informal sector is a source of income earning for the majority uh, of women on paid work. And it's also true that uh, with the advent of digital platforms now, um, a, a larger proportion of women are actually going also into the gig economy 
and informal sector partly because of the flexibility uh, those um, um, opportunities provide to women to function also around families. Two sets of actions on this, and I'll close on that. Um, the first one is uh, to support stronger net network provision uh, by fostering interaction among uh, infrastructure, payment, uh, and identification uh, platforms. They intensify the information flow, uh, as well as enhance interaction among connected individuals, businesses, and public service providers. This is including cross-border, uh, not just within uh, borders, where we know trade is extremely important. You find women dominant in trade, uh, cross-border trade in West Africa, uh, whether you go cross-regional uh, to Guangzhou in China, most of those you find there, again, are women. And uh, it is very important that we support that. And the last part is to make sure that we support startups and capacity for localizing global solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ndulu. But before I, I, I let you off the hook, because you've given a whole load of different things that countries need to think about and prioritize. And the reality is, are they, are they all interlinked? Are they, or are there one or two things that countries can focus on and get right first? And that you would say that if they, you know, if they're in the early stages, they should prioritize this. Can can you sort of break it down for us a lot? Because there was a lot in what you said. Two or three things. I think, yeah, I think the first the first must be women should be onboarded onto the platform. Otherwise, you can't use whether it's uh, payments or just digital services. So the questions of affordability, skills to use, etc., are fundamental. Uh, right. And second, it's really to uh, focus on the informal sector uh, uh, enabling uh, environment uh, for women to be able again to get back into income earning uh, activities. Okay, thank you, Professor Ndulu. So I'm coming to you next to um, Minister Lawson, because it'd be really interesting to hear about a real life example of digital financial services and a number of people have been talking about this program, Novisi, which was rolled out in Togo. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. And then I'd like you to comment on some of the things that um, Professor Ndulu talked about that countries should be prioritizing. But let's hear from you now about this fantastic um, service that um, had 65% of the beneficiaries were women, which is amazing. So let, let's hear from you now on some of the insights that you had from this cash transfer program. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Queen Ma Maxima, um, President Ramaphosa, uh, Nicolas de Rivière, uh, Melinda Gates, Professor Suri, um, Professor uh, Ndulu uh, for the insightful comments. I mean, it's, uh, it's a great honor. It's, it's my pleasure to talk about the Novici program, which uh, is, is very dear to us because it's an 100% uh, cash, um, digital, digital cash transfer that we implemented to support the informal sector um, um, who, uh, whose incomes were going to be impacted by the anti-COVID uh, measures that we took uh, a few months ago. So, uh, namely, um, you know, we, we had to, impl to implement uh, daily curfews. Uh, we had to uh, close uh, certain cities uh, the capital city, Lomé, and another uh, uh, prefectures um, uh, within the country, which is uh, Chaojo. So what is uh, Novisi? It's really, and Novisi means solidarity in, uh, in, uh, in Mina, in Ewe. Um, the, uh, we want, what we wanted to do was to support uh, households and um, through a program, and we were very, very mindful the, the, um, um, with the fact that uh, most informal sectors, a household uh, might not have access to the internet. So the Novisi program is 100% digital from onboarding to a cash transfer using a USSD or short code, which did not need uh, people to have access to the internet. But that's not the only, um, the only uh, uh, innovation 
um, for, for this program. The other thing was that we wanted to make sure, because when you're going to be spending money, you want to make sure that the money goes into the pockets of uh, the intended beneficiaries. So um, in the, in on the on, uh, onboarding process, we made sure that, uh, that these were real people uh, by um, asking people to register with their voters' ID. We had uh, presidential elections in uh, February, so two months before that. So we were sure that uh, people had up-to-date uh, voters' ID, biometric voters' ID. The other thing that was very important to us was to, get, to give more uh, payout, more money to women than men, because the rationale was that we wanted to make sure, we wanted to ensure that households were supported. And from what we know, um, uh, if you want to support a, a, a household, you're better off uh, giving money to uh, women than uh, men. So uh, we made sure, we, we gave 15% um, uh, more money to women than men. Um, and, and the payouts were really about uh, one third of minimum wage. Um, uh, but, but moving, so, so, so the, the last point I, I think is important to say was that once you registered, you received the, the payout immediately because we wanted to build trust. You know, it was very important for us that someone go, goes into this platform using his basic, his or her basic phone. It's, it's actually hers because 65% of beneficiaries were women and that they would immediately receive the first installment. So, um, and, and so to tell you how successful it was, when we launched it, we launched it, I think that less than two hours after uh, launching the, 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 the program, the platform got, got um, uh, frozen because we, 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 I mean, I don't know how, but we, we thought that people, that it would take one or two weeks for people to hear about this program. We didn't know that it was going to take less than two hours for the entire country to hear about this program and start registering. So it was uh, very, uh, it was very, we were very impressed by, by, by this. We, uh, we had uh, approximately 1.4 million Togolese um, uh, registering to the program, which is approximately 38% of the entire Togolese voting population, which is, you know, 35% of, of um, all adults of Togo registered to this program, which is to tell you how important it, it was. And out of these 1.3 million people, 570,000 people received, um, received uh, payment. And payment was based on eligibility, which uh, was determined uh, through the location where the people, where people were located and their professions, because our goal was to support uh, the uh, informal sector. Um, the whole program cost approximately, up to two months, cost um, $20 million, and the $20 million were partially funded through the National Solidarity Fund that we set up uh, as a respond, uh, uh, you know, as a fund to, to, to finance all the uh, COVID uh, anti-COVID efforts. And uh, I have to uh, say that this, this fund was um, made up of, uh, of resources from the Togolese government, from donors, I think uh, we have to, f to thank the French uh, Development Agency, IFD, and also uh, private donations. Um, I, I, if, do, do, do I still have a few minutes to say about yeah, no. a few things? Yeah, no, so go ahead. Terms, okay, so in terms of, um, in, in terms of, and I think that it's, it's, when you think about a cash transfer, it's not only, you know, the technical platform, it's, it's, it's not only about the uh, onboarding, it's also, about making sure that money is well spent. So the Novici program was not only the platform, but it was also a methodology. And in this methodology, I, I did mention earlier that we had a bi we, we used biometric ID to, to, to identify the beneficiaries, but we also were working with um, an auditing company, an external auditing company to have daily reconciliation of use of funds. We wanted to make sure that we were spending that this, because when you, when you do cash transfer, when you actually, when you do any innovative digital project, you have to make sure that everything is very square because if you fail, then you, it's not only the program that fails, you're, fa you're, you're failing for the next, I don't know how many years, because every time people will mention this program, they will say it doesn't work or for this and that reason. 
So you have a responsibility to not only succeed, but to uh, set up a, a methodology that people are going to be, uh, you know, looking up to saying, oh, you know, these guys, when they did, and, and what, I, what we do know from, from now on is that for any cash transfer, massive cash transfer in, in Togo, there will always be a methodology by which we would have daily reconciliation using external auditors because we set up the standards very high and it's going to be difficult for anybody coming after us to lower these standards. So I think it's very important. We also had a grievance um, a system. We worked with a call center. People could call every day and, and the call center received the millions of calls. Um, call the call center to ask you know, questions, to get help, to, uh, to, 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 for any kind of purposes that any, any questions they had, any information they wanted to have about the, pro, the, the program, any personal cases they faced, they could call the call center. And why this is important? This is important because remember, we're under COVID, we can't meet anyone. We can't, we, we can't meet this, anyone. So, but it's also important because we're right now doing impact studies. And uh, so we're calling all the beneficiaries and even people who registered but were not beneficiaries to understand the impact of our program. And I think that so far we've called approximately 15,000 people, you know, to really understand who the beneficiaries uh, are, how, how they, they spend the money, uh, what their concerns were, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty much um, in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Lawson, because it sounds like it was an amazing, amazing project. And the fact that it was so successful, there's going to be incredible learnings for you. So I'm going to come back to you to hear what Togo is going to be doing in the future um, around um, cash transfers and just digital financial services. So um, let's hear a little bit from the private sector perspective now. So we've got um, Patricia, who's on the um, on call with us. And you know, we often say the role of the private sector is about innovation. Um, and Safaricom, which is part of the Vodacom group, um, which Vodafone in Ghana is, has been the flag bearer for mobile money on the continent. I mean, let's think about, you know, Ghana and other markets where Vodacom operates, as an example, because it'd be interesting to hear what were some of the private sector constraints and, of course, some of the opportunities for a mobile network operator in this time. And especially, you know, one of the points that um, Professor Ndulu made, which was about um, overtaxation. So I'd love to hear from you, your, your thoughts on this space, especially relating to women as well. Patricia? Thank you. Thank you, Moki. And thanks to our panelists and also to our, our keynote speakers. So for, for us, we observed three things. One, there was a lot of interest in the getting financial technology companies running. There were a lot of interest in the mobile money issuers um, setting up. However, if you look at the legal and regulatory framework, it was important to have something in place that will help to, to regulate the industry because at that point, customer trust was also so important for people to believe in the system. And so having the, um, the payment systems and services act in place um, has really, really been helpful to regulate the industry. I think the other, the second most important thing to us was the removing the barriers and the restrictions to, to enhance the ease and the, and the cost of the transaction. So we work closely with the central bank um, to remove the cost of transactions and also to improve the tier limits. And I, I think um, and one of our panelists said, said that. Um, and I, I think the other important one was to remove the third party. So if you wanted to reduce the cost, you needed to put in the ease of transfer. So take out the third parties and allow a direct bank to wallet, wallet to wallet transfer. And so we have the interoperability platform and this has been significant in improving the way we, we transfer uh, money from one wallet to, to the other. The, the challenge, um, and we had to use our platform to, to move money to, to citizens. The government used our platform for the disbursement. And one of the difficulties was the unique identifier. So even if you had the SIM registered, you weren't sure that it was going to a woman. And so I think one of the things that government has done, and a lot of effort has gone into it this year, is to have the national identification card finally in place. So we now have a unique identifier that will be able to tell who this is and who the money is going to. And now how do you even find this person if you want to give him financial assistance, financial trading education? There's no digital address. 
And so there's been an active effort um, to, to put in the digital address system to help identify where people are. And, and this has been super, super, super helpful within, especially within this period. The opportunity that we see um, are in probably three areas. So if we want to encourage usage, if we want to, to stimulate the growth, then we need to provide women with, with use cases. We need to provide this, the micro, the small, the medium scale, scale enterprises with what is relevant for them. So direct access to affordable credit. And if you look at what we did in South Africa, this is, this is just one typical one, where women now through, through the service can access credit. They can have access to insurance. They can be able to save on their phones. Now, when the experience is so practical, he can, she can have an overdraft then it, it, encourages, it encourages usage. So that's one of the opportunities we see. I think the second one is, is policy. So enabling, digitalizing the, the payments process for essential services. If today majority of payments are still in cash, if we want to drive it, we can't just talk about it. We have to be deliberate. And so, if, and again, if, if you broaden the digitalization of payments, then you broaden the tax base, you move more women from the, the, the informal to a formal economy, you support financial inclusion. So we're really seeing that as an opportunity um, going forward. And I think the third, government being the probably the highest, um, the biggest employer, paying salaries, um, um, doing revenue collection through, through a more digital form is going to help, help improve the economy. So those are some of the opportunities we see, despite some of the challenges that I have highlighted. Okay. And, and I'd love um, for you to just talk a little bit about the, the, the cost of data issue, because that has come up and that's potentially an opportunity for users. If, you know, are, are people discussing the cost of data in your boardrooms? So cost of data is high. Uh, it's, it's top on a lot of people's agenda because people are working from home and would love to have access. But I think the difficulty um, for people have been even the access, making sure there's no congestion. So especially for health and for education, if they want to have access, there should be um, enough capacity. And that's what we spend a lot of time um, with our policyholders, making sure we can drum home that conversation. But definitely price reduction in data has been something that we've seen across the industry. But for me, I think making sure we can expand the network. Um, our policy makers were able to help us with Spectrum. This helped us to carry the traffic. We saw between 40 to 50 percent increase in data traffic. And so supporting at that time, you couldn't even bring equipment into the country. So your best bet was your, your spectrum availability. And that's where partnership with government becomes, becomes so important. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Patricia. So let's go to Ethiopia now and let's hear from Minister Tolina on how COVID-19 has accelerated efforts to build digitally connected communities across Ethiopia. So I'd love to hear more about what is Ethiopia prioritizing? What are the key drivers for your government's view on digital financial inclusion? Thank you so much, uh, Moki, and uh, greetings to all the panelists and the keynote speakers. Um, look, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, I guess, it brought to everybody's attention the importance of um, building inclusive digital economy. And to our credit, as Ethiopia, we started working on this early on, uh, when we started reforming our, our telecom sector, when we set building digital economy as one important source of economic growth and as one critical agenda. But I must admit, um, I think the challenge posed by the, by the pandemic have brought more opportunities, I think more energy for us to promote uh, financial inclusion. Um, we can see this in many aspects, for instance, on issue of connect connectivity, as Professor Rulo was saying, bridging the access and usage gap is important. What Ethio Telecom did uh, right at the wake of uh, the pandemic was to significantly cut cost of services, introducing price cuts of up to 65% tariff reduction for residential broadband internet services, 69% for enterprises, introducing the stay at home discounted package so that data can now be easily accessible. People can consent, it's affordable, and they can take advantage of it. And also, I guess it, it did encourage the government to accelerate the pace of reform. We wanted to create a vibrant uh, telecom industry in Ethiopia. To that end, we were privatizing. Uh, 
the incumbent, Ethio Telecom. They're also opening up sector for potentially to uh, entrance. Uh, and I think the pace of that reform has been accelerated, but also on the public sector front, uh, the agenda of e-government, I think, has, has, has advanced uh, significantly. I wouldn't take my time on this, but like the whole idea of conducting meetings online, uh, even in the health sector, because of the, the pandemic, uh, tremendous use of data collection tools, e-learning platforms has accelerated. But I think more importantly, and, and, and relevant to this, I guess, in the education sector, one critical issue that happened is girls uh, that were going to school because of the pandemic have stayed home now. And there was significant worry that they might stay at home forever. They may not go back to school again. And that would really uh, exacerbate uh, you know, the gender gap that is already, already very deep. So what we are doing now is as part of this, is working on availing 5 million tablets for girls and, and boys at school. Uh, this is going to be phenomenal for many, for many reasons. One, it ensures that education continues. We are going to ensure 100% uh, tablet coverage for high school students with mobile uh, you know, online content. But what more importantly, I think when girls in the rural areas take this tablet home, they will be introducing a new gadget, a new um, access to internet to their moms, to, to their aunties, and introducing the idea of using internet and, and, and some gadget uh, to access uh, the, the rest of the world. And if this is supported uh, by some innovation in the private sector, um, in creating the right kind of solution for utopian farmers, for pastoralists, um, it can significantly adv advance um, uh, digital financial increment. But on the later front as well, I think there are a lot of works in uh, adapting digital strategy, in revising our financial inclusion strategy altogether, in also uh, prioritizing um, digital literacy, uh, you know, financial literacy for girls and for women uh, across the board, across, across the country. Mm, yeah. But then finally, I think the agenda for entrepreneurship uh, has gained significant attention. The Prime Minister has set up the prize for startups, but startups that would create solution for everyday problem of women and girls and, and marginalized people in general. Solutions that are homegrown, uh, but that could be uh, on a global platform uh, that can connect um, people who have no access to the financial sector uh, to be included in the financial sector. And finally, I would like to end uh, with this. I guess I think the most profound thing I see uh, that has happened uh, post-COVID, I think it has brought this resolve in every uh, policy maker uh, that look, this time around, this is not a luxury. Um, we can't afford to delay uh, this piece of legislation and that we can do it a year uh, from now because it's, it's very, very important for people's life. People are sitting at home, uh, businesses have been disrupted, and how do we make sure these businesses continue? And how can we support them through access to finance, through uh, credit facilities? Uh, and I, I, I believe uh, this agenda has been brought to the forefront across uh, all stakeholders. Thank you, Minister Tonini, and absolutely on, on, on the impact of, of COVID and probably its unintended consequences, because it's absolutely accelerated digital transformation in so many ways. So, Professor Tadneet, I'm going to come back to you um, on the policies, but because of the work that you're doing and you've seen the impact of dig digital cash transfers, what are you learning about how we can actually design better policies that sort of impact women and the poor more? Yeah, I think we still have a lot to learn on that, Moki. Thanks for the question. I do think it's important to reach women. Um, you know, we've worked on Kenya and places where that's better. But if you look at, you know, the World Bank has this global data on access to mobile phones, access to digital accounts, women are far behind. And so I think uh, trying to reach out specifically to them is important. Um, you know, as Minister Lawson talked about her program, they made an extra effort to do this, um, but this was really helped by them having a biometric ID to start with. 
right? Um, and so some of the issues that you'll face is, you know, Patricia mentioned kind of IDs are an issue where there's no biometric ID. And so I think trying to understand more about IDs and how to create ID systems that allow people to verify themselves into these digital systems is gonna be a key part of that. Um, we just started an initiative at JPAL called Digify that tries to study bits and pieces of these digital ID systems as they're built, tries to make sure they're reaching the most marginal of the of, of, of the communities that you're trying to reach, right? I don't want just rich people to enroll in these systems. And so I think it would be great to sort of, as these ID systems get built, build partnerships with researchers to make sure that they're really reaching everybody and trying to create more equity in those systems. But I think it has to be those sorts of combinations of things, you know, uh, having an ID system is gonna be really essential to to expanding access to these things uh, and making them kind of more sort of uh, stable and more usable and more accessible. Okay, thank you. So Professor Antulia, I'm coming to you now. In an ideal world, we would just wave a magic wand and we'd create equitable digital financial systems across the continent. But the reality is that governments and some of the players in the sector, they're a little bit resistant. Um, share with us what you are seeing as some of the biggest risks posed by these new financial technologies that you know, governments in some cases are scared of? And what steps should regulars, regulators be taking to mitigate this risk? Professor Ndulu? Yes. Um, I think uh, there are two risks that uh, um, I would like to focus on. One is the cybersecurity breaches. Um, which uh, typically can put at risk uh, confidence and sustainability of the whole payment system. Um, because once people don't feel comfortable in terms of security and safety uh, of uh, their transactions, they actually walk away. So it's a very basic one and it's important that uh, regulators and um, authorities mandate that all service providers develop and approve a risk mitigating strategy uh, covering all the four mitigation dimensions which are avoidance, acceptance, transference and limitation. And it's also important that clear sets of standards uh, be actually developed in terms of uh, security and adherence to those uh, be also uh, emphasized. But most important is to set up a consumer redress system when things fail and happen. That's the only way in which credibility can actually be underlined. So this is one risk. The second one is uh, resolution challenges in case of a failure of a mobile money company. Uh, we don't want to talk about fa possible failures, but these are real uh, possibilities. That, uh, um, and there, the biggest challenge is the fact that um, there is an absence of equivalent of a deposit insurance arrangement uh, for uh, mobile money compared to those of banks. Um, but I think options now are being discussed and one that I'm more sympathetic to is uh, to go the route of disaggregating what we call as the trust account, uh, so that each holder uh, is treated as an individual depositor. Here is what is the trust account. Uh, for every uh, dollar or shilling that I hold in my electronic wallet, the company must uh, put an equivalent uh, in a trust account in a commercial bank. Uh, and uh, because those are identifiable, uh, uh, they have actually been used, the disaggregated data has been used to remunerate uh, all holders. Uh, so I get every quarter uh, a, a proportion of the interest earned in the trust account by that company based on how much I've kept on average as my balances. 
So if we can have that disaggregation, I think we can treat each holder of uh, a wallet almost like a depositor so that when there is failure, it's not one single account of the company which gets uh, 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 compensated almost nothing because it's a single one rather than each one of those actually being uh, 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 considered. So those are the two uh, risks that uh, I would put right at the top. Right, and I, I'm sure there, there are others. But let's move back to Minister um, Lawson. Now that you've seen the impact of the Novisi program, and we talked about it, and it sounds like it was an amazing success, what are you thinking about next to accelerate interest in using digital money in Togo? You've got all these people who've seen the benefit now. How are you leveraging that? Uh, thank you. Um, number one, we are going to launch um, a biometric um, ID program for all Togolese. Because remember, uh, in the Novisi program, we had to use a voter's ID because the population didn't have a biometric ID system. Now we are launching one um, early next year. Um, and, and our aim is to roll out this program and identify all Togolese. So that's number one. Number two is that, you know, when we were talking about women receiving funding, we need to make sure that women are receiving funding. So what it means is that we, we while registering, while rolling out this biometric ID program, we want to find a way to get phones to uh, phone, uh, actual phones to women. You know, every woman, every person in Togo should have a phone and we should make sure they do have a phone. And, and so that would be the plan number two. And uh, in the Novisi program, what we did was that every person, if, even people who didn't have mobile um, money account, the, the initial payment, the initial Novisi transfer created the account somehow working with telcos. So now what we want to do is that we want to roll out, while rolling out the biometric ID, we want to create mobile banking account to all Togolese so that they, we, we have the highest um, uh, percentage of people with a mobile uh, um, uh, account in, 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 uh, in West, in, in French speaking West Africa. Togo has the highest percentage, but I think that with the biometric ID program, we can go and have 100% of Togolese having a mobile money account. This is our objective. What we also need to say is that today we also have the means to get additional information. We are working with um, IPA and uh, Berkeley University uh, to have uh, poverty maps of Togo. You, we are able to draw maps of wealth and poverty maps of the entire country. And through this program, what we're also doing is that we're working with telecom operators we are we're collecting uh, data from them, uh, the CDRs, uh, uh, um, individual uh, um, uh, consumption information, so that we would know who um, is actually poor. So we, 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 we now know which region within Togo is poor, but we also know based on how they use their phones, which individual is poor. So it's, 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 um, it's a very important, I think, time in, in in this century where we have big data, every time people talk about big data, but this is a, a, a good use of big data. This is uh, something that governments should do because we have access to this information. We, 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 it's, it's high time we, we started using it in, 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 in order to better target uh, the, the, the poorest. Because if you look at us governments, uh, we have lots of information. But a lot of, we, and, and that was one of the challenges that we saw, um, it was that all, a, a lot of various ministries, ministries had database on, 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 on the poor, but we were, but this database did not collect information systematically. So these database uh, were very difficult to use in a very large programs because they were initially uh, designed for specific purposes. Now we are at a point in our history in Togo and in the world where we could um, reset certain things and use this information to say, you know, and, uh, who, and who is poor and how we can help him. And what I also want to say, because I think it's important, in the Novisi program, 
we asked people to register because we wanted them to ask to to say you know i'm 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 uh, i'm individual x and and i need i need the money we wanted them to take responsibility we thought it was very important to uh, give people their um dignity and and so that they would stand on their own feet saying um you know i'm 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 a mother i'm i'm i'm, I'm a father um i need this money and i know i'm going to spend it well so we felt it was also very important okay thank you for that mr lawson and i we coming we've got about 10 minutes left so i want to take some of the audience questions so i'm gonna ask this to you patricia and it's one of our audience questions and she's asking are we, as we know that women are less likely than men to have access to mobile phones, what steps can we take to reshape that? And I think it's actually one of the most critical questions because all of this is dependent on somebody having a phone of some sort to receive all of this, all of the benefits of digital financial services. So um, Patricia, I'd love to hear from you. How are we thinking about making sure that more people, particularly women, have access to mobile phones? A partnership with government um, is going to be significantly important. The, the access to the phone means that it is low cost, it is affordable, and it is easy to use by this woman. And so one of the things we have to look at is its tax incentives for those who can bring in the low cost handsets. Um, the other one is, is probably having an assembling plant locally. I know this is a consideration that is going on and a lot of discussions are going around that we have to make the costs of getting the handset into the hands of the woman much easier. But I think the bigger problem is even if she has a phone, how does she connect? Many of these women who cannot afford these phones are in areas where we have poor or no connectivity. And so um, if you look at what has happened over the years in Ghana, the telecom companies contribute 1% of their net revenue into like an infrastructure fund for electronic communication. Now this has to go into infrastructure. It has to be used to, to deliver rural connectivity for where these women are. And so that when they have handsets as well, they can have the network because we'll, we'll put a device and unfortunately she will not be able to find any network to use. So driving connectivity, making connectivity available to the woman in addition to the handset, um, I think will be important. The, the last one is, although she has the phone, I think we shouldn't forget that um, adding the skill to it is important. You know, it's one, one area that I think partnership is, is needed. Once the woman can earn an income, you, you've empowered her. But once she has the knowledge on how to save on the phone that you have given to her, how to access credit, and um, then that's the beginning of her liberation. You know, and so for me, the, the knowledge, the connectivity, the device um, have, have to go together. We spent time last year in the upper part of our country where we have a lot of um, our women who actually need this type of access. And we work together with UNDP. This is just an example of how private sector and um, the NGOs and government can come together, together with the regional ministry up there. And we, we our plan was to educate over 1,500 women, but that meant over 10,000 households were going to be empowered, giving them the financial skills training, um, allowing them to understand how to access credit, etc. So for me, these three have to go together. It's not just the phone, connectivity, and the, the literacy, the, the skills um, have, have to go together. And, and, and thanks for that. You talked a lot about, you know, it's private sector and, and public sector. So it's private public partnership in a lot of this. So I'm coming to you now, Minister Talina, because Ethiopia has been undergoing some reforms to increase private sector participation in the economy. So how is this translating to the digital financial services space? And how do you see the private sector's role in assisting governments and your regulators in their efforts for digital financial inclusion? Thank you so much. Uh, that's a very good question. <clears throat> I guess um, it's very important to underscore that DFI requires participation of all stakeholders, private, public, civil society, development partners. I'm glad to see that all are represented here. And, and your panel shows that unless we all come together, we can really solve uh, this challenge. In terms of as kids, the way we view this, we want the government to be more of a development enabler. Uh, by delivering the key foundational things, such as digital ID, 
uh, you know, e-government solutions, um, uh, starting up a fund for instance, the startup fund that I mentioned, and also creating uh, an enabling uh, regulatory environment. Uh, our approach is more of a sandbox approach now. I mean, you know, we have had, uh, the government has been accused of over-regulating it, but now that we are changing that completely when it comes to digital financial inclusion. Uh, but also some trendsetters. For instance, the Prime Minister has inaugurated an artificial intelligence center uh, just a few days ago. Uh, and this has profound implication because uh, in a country where credit is largely based on collateral and so on, if we can use AI, for instance, to understand people's uh, credibility, their, their spending uh, uh, ability, um, and then score them accordingly, as Professor Nguro uh, was saying earlier on, then this can uh, have significant impact on, on financial economy. But on private sector side as well, there's a very important role, role to play. Um, the most important one being accelerating um, sort of uh, investment in technology, in interoperable payment infrastructures, agent networks, uh, and things of this sort. But, but more importantly, I think innovating solutions. The private sector should be, should be the key innovator. In Ethiopia's case, the way we look at this, we have over 400,000 uh, STEM graduates every year that are coming out of university. And every year, the intake is about 150, 300,000 students. These students are studying I ICT, maths, technology, and we want them to be innovators, key uh, enablers uh, for the digital financial inclusion. Then the development partners, uh, we believe, need to work on in, in supporting uh, access to finance, uh, in, in sort of funding some of these critically important um, projects. But overall, the way we, we see it, uh, I think this partnership is working very well. The government is, is really encouraging the private sector. We, we see now uh, new innovations mushrooming everywhere. Very interesting solutions. For instance, because of COVID, you could see e-commerce sectors coming up in small man and pub shops, uh, ranging from hotels, small shops, and so on. This is overly encouraging. In fact, using existing media page like uh, Telegram channels, uh, uh, or perhaps even Facebook channels, but catering to their consumers. And who are benefiting from this? Small, uh, small scale businesses, mom and pop shops, and women in particular. Very, very interesting development. So. Thank you for that. I, I really have to end now because we are on time and I would love to thank you, the panel, for your insights. It's actually been really great to hear some of the service that African countries are rolling out. I mean, progress is being made because of rather than in spite of this pandemic. So Professor Suri, Professor Ndulu, Professor Lawson, sorry, Minister Lawson, Minister Tolina and Patricia Obonai. Thank you very much for your time today and thank you to the audience for joining. And you know, sessions like this are really a way of keeping attention laser focused on the issues. And if there is a call to action from today, it's around two things. We have to connect digital financial inclusion to building back better. And we have to recognize the urgency to accelerate and invest in digital public goods. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity to financially include and empower women on a massive scale, and this has never been more important. You know, the world is experiencing an economic crisis, and that only serves to widen the gap and magnify inequality. There is one solution, and that solution must be at the center of the global development agenda. That's making sure that women are included in the formal economy and that they have the financial tools they need and both of these will lead to economic power for women. What we observe today is that donors, implementers, and African governments are already working together on digital financial services, and they're building more inclusive and much more resilient economies in the wake of the pandemic. The G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa is a simple blueprint that will help bring 400 million people into the digital economy and Africa can lead the way. We have done it before with mobile telephony and we can do it again. So on that hopeful note, I would love to bring this session to a close and thank you all for your important contributions to this work. We look forward to seeing you next year. It's good night from me, Moki Makura in Johannesburg. <laughs>